Hey, everyone. Yeah, hello. Okay, so we're going to get started. I know people are still trickling in, um, but we want to respect everyone's time. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this week's Biome Seminar. We are super pleased to have Dr. Emily Bernhardt here with us this week. Um, and I know we go through this every week, but over the last 12 years, uh, the Yale School of the Environment has held this weekly seminar series, which we have called Biomes, which has been the school's flagship forum for bringing cutting edge research and impactful work to the community. Biomes here stands for Bridging Issues and Optimizing Methods in the Environmental Studies. In this vein, I am super excited to be able to introduce Dr. Bernhardt, who quite literally helped to write a book on biogeochemistry. I forgot to bring it, but I would have had it right here. Um, Dr. Bernhardt is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor at Duke University and ecosystem ecologist and biogeochemist. Dr. Bernhardt's research is principally concerned with tracking the movement of elements through ecological systems. Her research aims to document the extent to which the structure and function of aquatic ecosystems are being altered by land use change global change, and chemical pollution. Ultimately, the information produced by this research is necessary to determine whether and how ecosystem change can be mitigated or prevented through active ecosystem management. So with that, could we please give Dr. Bernhardt a warm welcome? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am super impressed by the size of the crowd. I think at Duke, we're still doing pandemic recovery. So I'm going to go back and challenge them to do a better job. Um, I am really excited to talk to you today about rivers. I love rivers. I grew up playing in rivers. And it's just exciting to learn that I could spend my entire life continuing to do that. Um, this is a river that's going to appear multiple times in the talk. This is New Hope Creek. Um, it is uh, the largest stream contained within the Duke Forest, which is Duke's research forest, equivalent to your research forest here at Yale. Um, and it'll appear multiple times. Um, I love rivers, and I think most people do too. Who, who here loves rivers? Yeah. I mean, there's sort of these iconic places that, like, as a kid, you love to play in. It's incredibly full of interesting and fascinating organisms. Um, for many of our cities, they are sort of the place that brings us together. Um, and at the same time, we treat them like can I say that here? Like, shit, right? We do a lot of things to them that really challenge their ability to continue to provide us with the amazing ecosystem services of clean water, the support of freshwater organisms. Um, and we do that in all kinds of ways, right? We build our cities, we put our farms and our watersheds, and pretty much because rivers sit downstream of everything, everything that happens on the landscape ends up running off into our stream ecosystems in ways that we often don't intend, which could cause significant damage. And of course, climate change is a force amplifier on all of these existing challenges for freshwater ecosystems because we're seeing our river and stream temperatures get hotter. That kind of exacerbates lots of chemical pollution issues, particularly oxygen problems. Uh, we're seeing many of our rivers across the, uh, the world and particularly uh, uh, in the United States getting wetter with more extreme precipitation events. And at the same time and kind of counterintuitively also getting drier. So we're seeing a lot more of our river systems moving between sort of extremes, this sort of weather whiplash between more extensive drought and more extreme flooding. Um, and so even if we didn't have all the background problems, climate change would be an issue. But as we try to understand climate change, we have to do that against this backdrop of all these other insults. So for the last, I guess it's been about eight years now, I've been involved in a project where the title of the grant was Are There Stream Biomes? Which I thought was very appropriate for this seminar, which is actually not about biomes, but it is the title of your seminar. Um, and this is uh, one of my favorite figures I've ever published um, because I was able to get this published without any y-axis. <laughs> and uh, this was the title of the grant, but we actually began calling this the Stream Pulse Project. And the idea was, how do we take the pulse of rivers? The sort of energetic regimes of rivers, how do they make energy from the, the sun and from the leaves and sticks that fall on them and turn that into the beautiful uh, biodiversity that we see in rivers? And so what this graph is, the actual y-axis is oxygen concentrations. And each of these is a four years of 
of, day, of hourly auction data from four different rivers in the United States. And it does kind of look like a cardiograph, right? Like it's almost like you're seeing the pulse of these four different rivers. We'll come back to this a few times, but you can see this Menominee River in Wisconsin having this like super strong seasonal growing season it looks more like a forest. It's a nice clear river full of agricultural runoff and full of macrophytes. So it's like a river of grass. Then you see this Fano Creek, Oregon, a really shaded, um, uh, temperate rainforest stream that has uh, almost nothing going on. The San Antonio River in Texas, really frequent urban storm waters. So we have these different signals that show up and we want to take this kind of data and turn it into information about how rivers work. And I should say at the outset that this is work that has been done as part of an enormous team. Uh, these are the folks that help uh, write the grant and we're partners in it. And so Pete Raymond was one of our collaborators here through his work on the Connecticut River. And the idea was to take some of the, uh, a lot of the work that's been going on in rivers for a long time about flow regimes and temperature regimes and think about how we might apply that to energetic regimes. So let me just give you a few sort of regime change in rivers. So the flow regime is probably the first concept where we started thinking about regimes, where the idea is that every river has a natural flow regime, periods of time in the year where you would expect high flows and low flows. For much of the Northeast, that you're really focusing much of your hydrograph year on snowmelt, right? Snowmelt is the organizing flood of the year, and then you expect lower flows through the growing season, right, and, and higher flows through the fall. And then you have your sort of storm intensity and when that happens, when it happens, and where it happens. These are really important organizing features for how the channel is structured, but also how organisms conduct their lives. So the life history of freshwater organisms is often very tied to key flow events in the year. If you're in a monsoon system, you really want to get out of that stream as an aquatic insect or move to safe places right before that monsoon flood, right? If you're in a stream that dries in the late summer, you want to finish your life cycle before that happens. So these are really important organizing events. And a lot of the things that we have done in our management of rivers, intentional and otherwise, has really altered these regimes. Super obvious when you build a dam, you've changed the flow regime, but less obvious when we build a city. We also increase the movement of rain into stream waters and we change the flow regime. So a lot of interest in how do we understand what the flow regime should be for a system and how do we best approximate that in systems that have been altered in ways that allow sort of the natural signals to come back. Receive less attention, but I think equally important is the natural thermal regime of a river. So this again is just, you expect sort of particular annual cycles of temperature. It's warmer in the summer, it's cooler in the winter. But this, uh, these sort of thermal regimes are also really important for guiding the life cycle. And a lot of things that we've done, removing riparian vegetation, uh, using water for heating and cooling and putting hot waters back in systems, wastewater inputs, all these things alter the thermal regime of rivers, which again, changes the cues relative to what the organisms living in those systems have evolved to. So, Thinking about this, there's been a lot of attention about how if we could fix the thermal regime and the flow regime, perhaps that would then, that would help us um, protect freshwater biodiversity. And we've been thinking a lot about how these thermal regimes and um, hydrologic regimes affect the energy at the base of the food web, affect how, affect how well or how efficient um, algae and microbes are at converting solar energy or leaf litter and materials coming from the terrestrial ecosystem into the food that fuels the food web. In order to do that, we have to think about light as well, right? So the light regime in rivers is another thing that has received less attention. It's a little bit confusing because the light regime in a lake or in a terrestrial ecosystem is really closely tied to the thermal regime, right? So in the, in, in the long days of the summer, it's hotter and there's more light. But in a river, that's often not the case. And especially to keep in mind that most rivers are small. Headwaters dominate the river network length, right? So a huge proportion of rivers are covered by canopy during the warmest periods of the year. And so in fact, the light regime of many rivers is bimodal, right? So short day lengths in the middle of the winter, keep your light input low. So it, I'm showing you here, let's look at the observed, it's the black lines for a stream. Um, this is actually for New Hope Creek. You can see that the light goes up as you go through the spring as the day lengths increase. But then as soon as the canopy leaves out, we have really low light reaching that stream again. And it's not until the canopy uh, starts to drop its leaves that you see this sort of second pulse of high light um, in, the, in, the, in the late fall. And so a lot of our systems have the light and the temperature regime actually quite distinct from one another. And that's, that's pretty interesting and really important to understand and can actually be a big driver of the, of the energetic regime that we see. So we go back to this idea and what we wanted to do is take these oxygen profiles and convert them into estimates 
of gross prime production and ecosystem respiration for rivers using, how many of you ever heard of light bottle, dark bottle approaches? This is the way we used to measure productivity, we still do, uh, in, in the ocean and in lakes, where you put, um, you put a water sample into two bottles, one covered in duct tape and one open to the light, and you measure the change in oxygen over the course of the incubation. In the light bottle, you've got algae fixing carbon and releasing oxygen, and you've also got microbes um, chewing up carbon and releasing CO2. And in the dark bottle, you only have uh, the heterotrophic activity. And so by difference, you can calculate what the productivity is in the bulk system. Do exactly the same thing in an open channel with an oxygen sensor. So we measure the change in oxygen from night, from midnight to noon to midnight. And we can use the nighttime um, dark estimates of respiration to back out what respiration is all day long. And we can use these sort of daily pulses of oxygen to calculate the change in oxygen over time to calculate both productivity and ecosystem respiration. We won't get into the details of this. If you want to talk about um, gas exchange, Pete Raymond is your guy. Um, but this is really complicated. But basically, we can take this daily pulse and convert that into an estimate of how much carbon is being fixed and how much is being respired by the organisms in the stream, dominated by the stuff at the base of the food web. Now, for a long time, doing this was really time consuming because you had to actually go out and take samples from your system every hour, every two hours. You had to take it back to the lab and you had to run a Winkler titration with a burette. And it, was, it took a lot of time. But the very first attempts to measure whole ecosystem productivity were done in rivers and lakes by, the, uh, by Howard and Eugene Odom. And so this is, uh, this is an early river um, metabolism study done by Charlie Hall in New Hope Creek, the stream that I showed you at the very beginning uh, when Charlie did his PhD at Duke University uh, with Howard Odom. And so what Charlie has done is gone out and sampled every four hours uh, oxygen concentrations in New Hope Creek. And he's used that to estimate the daily, uh, daily estimate of metabolism. And so um, because this is so time consuming, there were very few estimates of river metabolism ever made. Charlie Hall's paper in the late 60s was sort of like the only one that did this for many, many years. And I'll show you what he found. So this is from New Hope Creek. Uh, 1969 was the year where he, 1960, 1970. I think he made about 70 individual measurements, which is a huge amount of work, 70 individual days for which he did a whole dial cycle of oxygen concentrations using those Winkler titrations. This graph is a little bit confusing, let me walk you through it. So at the top, you're seeing the amount of sunlight coming through the canopy, and you can see you've got that peak of sunlight in the spring, and then the canopy leaves out, and we have very little solar energy coming in at the time. On the bottom graph, the open area is the productivity, sort of the algal photosynthetic rate that's happening. And you can see that's really closely tied to the light availability. So you get this pulse, this algal bloom in the spring, and then we have pretty low productivity through the rest of the year. On top of that, and it's not additive, it's actually that is the actual graph. So the respiration is the, the dark gray bars. That's the total amount of CO2 being produced by all the heterotrophic activity in the stream. And it's always higher than productivity because almost every stream, most of the time, is respiring more carbon than it's fixing because you're getting these massive subsidies of carbon coming in from the surrounding landscape in the form of leaf litter and dissolved organic carbon. So what you can see here is that there's a peak of respiration that's associated with that algal bloom. And there's a second peak in October. And that's probably not too surprising. My, grad student, my former grad student, Audrey Tellman, calls this the autumn buffet. This is when leaf litter falls into the stream and the microbes go crazy chewing it up, right? So you get a second peak of uh, energetic activity at the, in the fall associated with respiration. But you see you've got this sort of bimodal energy uh, system that does not match what you see for the, for the surrounding terrestrial ecosystem. So Charlie Hall's um, work was the first time to get um, sort of a near continuous measurement of what an annual cycle metabolism might do. And then literally no one did that again for 30 years because it was so much work. It's an amazing paper in ecology and it's not cited nearly enough. Then, because I guess I don't know, nobody else wanted to do the Winkler titrations. Then we started to see the use of real-time oxygen sensors that you could stick in the stream, right? So now suddenly it's really easy to put an instrument in your river and leave it out there a day, night, day, and then come back and do a model and you don't have to do those Winkler titrations. So we started to see this. Now, still a constraint is that these initially cost like $50,000. So no one wanted to leave them out in a system except on a beautiful sunny day with no chance of rain, right? Which is not like, that's not every day in a stream. 
So you started to see a lot of measurements of sort of a single day of metabolism, which then people would estimate, use to estimate metabolism for streams all the time. One of the first efforts to do this sort of geographically was the Lodic intersite nitrogen experiment, where they went across 72 streams in multiple different biomes, and they measured um, a couple of days of metabolism in all these streams. And if you're trying to see a pattern in these data, there is not one, right? Despite the fact that these are rivers from a really wide variety of places and terrestrial biomes, there is no systematic difference between them. And indeed, if I put Charlie Hall's data on here, you would see that Charlie Hall's individual days encompass almost this entire cloud of points. So within any individual stream, you get as much variation within an individual stream as you could do for these points across biomes. And that, you know, this is really a sort of a problem for trying to use this kind of data to interpret pattern across rivers. So this idea of having near, so this near continuous data that Charlie had really didn't happen again for, for 30 years. We had a couple of early adopters uh, with these two papers, one by Urs Erlinger for a stream in Switzerland, and the other by Brian Roberts working with Pat Mulholland at Oak Ridge uh, National Lab in Tennessee, this is Walker Branch. So Erlinger's paper, uh, this is for a river downstream of a hydropower dam that used hydro peaking. So you see the hydrograph at the top there, there's super high peak flows that happen all the time. Those are water releases from the dam to generate power. And the, the bed downstream in this channel is a rocky bed. And so you can imagine each time they do that, you have a scouring flow event. And you can kind of see that in the productivity, right? You get these big peaks, it's high light below a dam, but it's also really frequently flooded. So Ursa Oerlinger's paper focused on how uh, high discharge events keep knocking productivity down. So you get this super dynamic, flashy energetic regime that is a result of this altered hydrologic pattern and altered canopy structure. Walker Branch looks a lot more like what uh, Charlie Hall found for New Hope Creek. This is another deciduous forested stream in the southeast. Um, the top graph shows in gray the light coming above the canopy, in black the light below the canopy, same thing, high light in the spring, low light the rest of the year. And you see this really strong productivity peak, the pro-spring productivity, the black lines in, the, in this lower right panel, high algal bloom in the spring, and then just like nothing happens with the algae the rest of the year, it's too shaded. And then this big fall spike associated with leaf litter falling in the stream. So again, you get this sort of two-stage uh, shoulder season productivity at the bottom of the river. So these are our, our next two. So it's 1970. The next one comes out in 2006. We get another one in 2007. We've got three annual patterns of metabolism for streams of the world at the point that we write this proposal. So we write this proposal where we want to fill in this gap. How do we think about continuous metabolism of rivers across uh, across many different places? How do we actually start describing the regimes, not just some random point we picked in a day of the year? And so that was the impetus for the Stream Pulse project. Okay, so let me just show you a little bit of, of like how important that is to think about. So in each of these four figures that I showed you before, we could pick any random day for which the actual rates of metabolism are exactly the same. But I think you can see from this trace that these rivers do not have the same energetic regime at all, right? And so really without continuous measurement, we're missing a lot. So I already showed you this, how you could pick out any individual day. I can show you now for sort of three days, a high day, a low day, and a medium day for each of those rivers, right? They have tremendous variability over, uh, over the course of even a month for each of these systems. And I can show you here for a 60 day uh, sample taken from each of those four rivers, how important the hydrograph is to the pattern of productivity. So I'm showing you in green in each of these graphs, productivity. So the top graph is oxygen, but on the bottom graph, I'm showing you productivity calculated from oxygen for a 60 day period. And the gray is showing you the hydrograph. And I think you should be able to see that every time there's a, a storm event, you knock back productivity, right? So we have a really responsive system where the flow regime is a really strong controller of how much algal photosynthesis can occur. And so your difference in flow regimes across systems is gonna be a big driver of the variability in your metabolic regime. Okay, so the three questions that we were asking in the Stream Pulse project is, what is the role of rivers in global carbon cycling? And I, I bet folks here have thought about that a lot because Pete is one of the sort of world experts in thinking about that. Do rivers have characteristic metabolic regimes? Ways that their, their individual carbon cycle is sort of operating through the year, the phenology, if you will, the ecosystem phenology, if you will, of river systems. And how are they changing? You know, we have three measures. So how are we gonna actually know how things are changing over time? How, do we, how can we use gradient analysis to think about that? 
So when we started, we wrote the grant with nine PIs, and each of us were going to do three different systems. And so the goal is we were going to have 27 annual regimes by the end. And within a year, we had 215 annual metabolism regimes for multiple years because we discovered that the USGS had these long-term auction records they had been using for auction compliance uh, data that had never been converted into metabolism. So we're, very, we're able very rapidly to exceed our expectations. I'm just going to show you a few. The mastermind behind a lot of this modeling work and cleaning this data was Allison Appling, who's a phenomenal data scientist now with the USGS and a former PhD student of mine. I'm just going to show you a few because I love looking at these. So in each graph, the yellow is light above the canopy. Um, the gray is the water table or your hydrograph. The black lines above the, the middle bar are your gross hormone productivity, and the black dots below your ecosystem respiration every single day. And you can just see this tremendous variability, right, in the magnitude and the timing. And then this is a figure, you'll see a number of these. these are called, we call them the lips figure because they look like very badly painted lips for, I don't know, Mardi Gras or something. Um, and each of them is basically the, the green line on the top there is showing you the median daily gross hormone productivity for all 215 rivers. And the shaded area around is the interquartile range for all those rivers. The brown line does the same thing for ecosystem respiration on a daily basis. And then the black line is the net ecosystem productivity. So the, the, basically the difference between primary production and ecosystem respiration. And so going from having like 72 random day samples from a bunch of different streams or having three rivers for which you calculate the rest, the metabolism for the whole world. We now have an estimate based on 215 rivers. Still not nearly enough, but I would argue a lot better than what we started with. And so we can take these numbers and say, okay, the average stream for which we have data, these are sort of mid-size uh, rivers uh, in the USGS database, is, is basically fixing about 156 grams of carbon per year and respiring about 400 grams of carbon per year. Most, so this means most rivers are highly heterotrophic. They're burning up a lot more carbon they're getting from the terrestrial landscape than they are producing in situ. Um, and then that's true almost all of the year. And that you do in general have more productivity in the warmer months than the cooler months. And you can see that ecosystem restoration skewed a little bit more towards the fall because we do have more carbon inputs at that time. So we can take that kind of data and improve our estimates of the role of rivers in the carbon cycle Rivers do a lot of work to move terrestrial carbon to the atmosphere or to, or to the ocean as uh, dissolved CO2 that's, ge that's generated in their watershed and simply uh, the river's a chimney, which is transported out of the watershed as, as carbonate or bicarbonate. But they also, the part that's not really included here is that carbon that sticks in there and actually contributes as food to the food web, right? And that's what I really wanna spend the rest of the time talking about. So we have slightly improved upon our estimates, I would argue, and can continue to do so. But what I think is really the most important part of this work is to think about whether there are characteristic metabolic regimes, things that might be really important to how we understand how these ecosystems work in supporting biodiversity. I think it was Bill McDowell, one of our PIs, who suggested this is a rephrasing of our question, like do rivers have a rhythm, a rhythm in the energy um, production? Phil Savoy was a, a lead postdoc on our, um, our project, and he spent a lot of time thinking about how do we actually begin to assess this sort of variation in, um, in ecosystem phenology. And we're borrowing a lot of techniques from hydrology, which has done a huge amount of work to characterize like the changes in flow over the course of the year. So the first attempt was to take the, the best uh, records that had at least five years of data from the USGS and do a clustering analysis, a dynamic time series modeling of uh, the, first, the first paper coming out with about 45 uh, watersheds, of uh, 45 streams. And what Phil found was that we, we can have sort of four characteristic regimes. And this is actually kind of held up as we add more and more data. Um, where you have uh, on the top there are streams that just kind of do nothing. And you can imagine these are streams that are like really frequently disturbed, they're in a pipe, or they're very, very turbid. There's just no light. So their productivity regimes are really, really boring all year long. Um, we've got the sort of classic summer peaking streams. We've got the spring peaking streams, like I showed you before, these sort of deciduous forested systems. Uh, and then those can be of various magnitude. And the big branches here are canopy shading. Is it an open canopy or is it a closed canopy? Um, and then um, hydrologic disturbance. So a really disturbed system has a much harder time converting light into productivity. So um, the sort of concluding or a sort of big paper coming out at the end of our project, which we published in 2022 um, for uh, 270 rivers. Um, this is a complicated lips figure. I'm gonna walk you through it. Shows us that this shows up um, over time. So we've sort of 
started to take this entire data set and basically looked on the left hand, on your left hand side, the uh, highest quartile, those rivers receiving the highest light, and the, the lower is the lower quartile, those receiving the lowest light. You can see light is a big driver of change, right? So rivers that get a lot of light, and here we're estimating it based on um, a modus associated sort of leaf area index. We actually calculate the amount of light reaching the stream, not the amount of light reaching the top of the canopy. So those rivers that get more light to the top of the stream channel have substantially higher, almost four times higher productivity than those rivers that receive very little light. And it's not really shocking, but it's important to show, right? Um, on the right-hand side, we've got the same thing. We take the same data set and we take the, those, um, those rivers with the most stable flows, the highest um, autoregressive coefficient. So one day is more like another, and those with the most unstable flows. You can see again here, we have almost a similar amount of difference between these ones that have fairly stable flows and these ones that have unstable flows or really flashy systems. Um, and so the, these are sort of the big drivers. We begin to talk about this as um, uh, dark and unstable, right? These in the middle here. Uh, it's really bad to be dark and unstable from an energetic standpoint, right? It's like just not a lot of energy coming in the system and no time to use it. And then the uh, bright and stable, which everybody wants to be, right? It's like a good way to approach graduate school. Um, also very good for river productivity. So those rivers that have stable flows and high light are the most productive. Now this is not rocket science, but it's really nice to show that sort of these basic ideas, the hydrologic regime and the light regime are the primary drivers of variation across uh, river systems. And that's important because we are manipulating that all the time with the way we manage our river systems and our watersheds. Okay, so how are they changing? And I'm going to show you a bunch of different examples, uh, mostly from my lab, but from some, from some others. This is one that we did in our initial paper. We showed this in the grant proposal itself. This was an auction data set from Spain uh, that Maite Aroita, who was a postdoc affiliate with the project, um, uncovered. It was like 20 years of data 10 years before and 10 years after they put in a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so really nice. What I'm showing you here, this plot is productivity on the right, ecosystem restoration on the left. We call this the fingerprint plot. It's a kernel density plot. So basically in the center of that is the 25th quartile. That's where the stream is spending most of its time. And then as you move out, it's like more rare instances. But everything, basically the data points all sit inside that kernel density plot. Black is the um, 10 years before the wastewater treatment plant went in. And green is after the wastewater treatment plant was put in. I think it probably surprises you. Like I would think the big thing that wastewater treatment plants do is put tons of nutrients in the river, right? So then once you remove that extra nutrients or you reduce that down, you would shrink your productivity down. And you really don't. That stays pretty much the same. The big change is that there's an enormous amount of organic carbon, really labeled juicy carbon coming out of the sewage treatment plant that is really exacerbating respiration. This is the oxygen sag that you often see uh, as a result of wastewater. And so what happens is you see this massive reduction in the amount of heterotrophic activity. You're no longer subsidizing this river with lots of raw sewage. So we've, we proposed in our initial paper that this kind of analysis could be a great way of, evalu of evaluating the effectiveness of an intervention, right? That that's actually really good to reduce the amount of oxygen consumption below a wastewater dream plant. I'm going to show you now how we think about this like in an urban stream context, or urban management context, urban land use planning. This is work done by Joanna Blaschak when she was a PhD student with me. She's now a professor at the University of Nevada, Rito. And what Joanna did was looked at metabolism across a set of small watersheds in the, uh, the urban area of uh, Raleigh, Durham. And each of these watersheds was selected because they had, they're part of a data set of 25 watersheds that all were 10% impervious cover but very different configurations of that impervious cover. So what we did was we selected within that data set, these six streams had really different stormwater pipe and road density. So it's sort of a connectivity gradient. So despite having very similar land cover, the uh, flow regimes are really different. So the, the least lowest road density one is on the top F1 and the highest road and pipe density one is on the bottom. You can see these are getting the exact same incoming rain, but what that generates in terms of stream flow, incredibly different because the lower watershed is just taking every single drop of rain and routing it straight into the channel. This lower stream had a, had a sort of bed scouring event roughly every six days, right? Uh, kind of hard to make a living. And then here on the right-hand side, we've converted those hydrographs into Richard Baker's flashiness index. So the, um, basically we have this big gradient and how flashy or how uh, frequently you have storms in those channels. So then Joanna modeled metabolism across these um, six streams continuously over the course of two years. And now we're looking at um, 
light on the x-axis and daily productivity on the y-axis across these different streams. And what I want you to see is the slope shifting as you get into the least flashy, the flashiest stream. It's really sort of dichotomous, right? But basically your ability to take light and turn it into algae dramatically reduces as you get more and more flashes. That makes a ton of sense, right? So if you are trying to make a living as an algal cell, it is really hard if every three or four days the bed moves, right? Or you're scoured off, or you're basically sandblasted by the amount of sediment that's moving through the system. And so that's what we see here, that the efficiency of the system to convert light into uh, great food at the base of the food web is really constrained by hydrology. Okay. Now I'm gonna show you my best climate change story. And it's really hard because as I said, we have like one estimate of metabolism over the course of a year from a river um, in the la you know, from you know, more than 20 years ago. And that's Charlie Hall's data. Alice Carter was a PhD student in my group who decided to repeat Charlie Hall's study in New Hope Creek uh, using the exact same places as Charlie worked. This is a pretty interesting um, stream because it happens to be almost entirely enclosed within the Duke Research Forest. So it's one of the most protected rivers in the Piedmont of North Carolina, by which I mean it's not that protected, but it's pretty good, right? And it's had very little land use change over, over the period since the late 60s to the, to the present day. I'm gonna remind you, this is Charlie Hall's original data that I showed you at the very beginning. Um, and then basically, um, Alice went out and did it again, but of course with easier methods, she didn't have to do wrinkle titrations. Let me show you what's happening over time with the climate in the Piedmont of North Carolina. On the left-hand side, we're looking at mean annual air temperature, like everywhere else, it's gotten warmer. And then we don't have continuous water temperature data for the last uh, 40, 40 years, 60 years, but we do have Charlie's data and Alice's data. So Charlie's data for uh, 2019 versus, uh, sorry, Charlie's data for 1969 and Alice's data for 2019. Uh, Charlie's data in red, the old data, and the newer data in black. And you can see it's always hotter in the water column. And I really want to point your attention to, in 1969, New Hope Creek froze. And in 2019, New Hope Creek was often 10 degrees C at the same time that it froze back in 1969. So massive changes in the thermal regime of this river, and particularly in the winter. And we're seeing, we're seeing that in a lot of systems. We also see pretty big changes in the hydrology driven by climate, not by land use change in this system. So on the, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you uh, the annual precipitation not really changed, but the percent of extreme events has increased over these decades, and the number of no precipitation days has increased. So we've got bigger events and longer periods between events, sort of the, the classic amplification of extremes. And then this is the hydrograph from 2019 versus 1969. In 1969, you can see we do have uh, storms. The stream never dries up, right? And then you can see in 2019, Alice's data, the peaks are higher and the stream dries up for about two weeks during that year, which we don't have any evidence that it was doing back in the early 70s. So what happens to the uh, metabolic regime? So now I'm showing you Charlie's data on the left and Alice's data on the right. Pretty big shift, right? Way more heterotrophic, like way more CO2 being produced. We still have a spring peak, um, but we, we have this massive respiration peak in the fall, and you notice that it goes through the entire winter. So I became very interested in this because you've got this hotter temperatures in the winter. So many of the organisms that live in streams make their living growing up, eating the leaf litter that made it through the winter, and then emerging as adult aquatic insects in the spring, or putting on a lot of fish biomass during the spring. And I really worry that we've basically really enhanced the amount of carbon that's moving through the microbial loop uh, during the winter in this increasingly warm stream. So if I put these side by side, what you can see is that carbon cycling has accelerated in Hope Creek between these two years. Now, I can't say this is a linear trend. I just have two years. I'm just saying this is very consistent with the fact that the stream is flashier and hotter, right? Um, we've, that the dominant metabolic window has shifted from the spring to the fall, and it had a net shift towards heterotrophy. So productivity has increased as well, but not nearly as much as, as, um, as heterotrophy. So this is a pretty big shift, and I think the implications for higher organisms is very interesting and completely understudied at this point. Okay, so now let's think about the bugs. So um, I convinced uh, Johnny Behrens, who just finished his PhD in the spring, to, to take to build on Alice's work and look at um, secondary production. So this is the total production of insect biomass um, in New Hope Creek. And then for comparison, we compared it to uh, the adjacent, very urban watershed that drains um, 
Durham, North Carolina. And in that basin, it's like the same size, but you've got two different sort of urban signals. We have one site that is primarily getting stormwater runoff in a sewage treatment system supported um, urban core. And then downstream of that, you've got a site that's downstream of uh, North Durham wastewater treatment plant that's treating most of the wastewater in Durham. So you kind of got these two very different urban signals going on in Ellerbee Creek. Um, just showing you here on the right-hand side, nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations very elevated um, in our two urban sites relative to the forested site. So I'm going to go straight to the data. Um, on the left is New Hope Creek. We've got our uh, metabolism. Notice this does not go like on a normal year just because Johnny started collecting data in, uh, in, in April through the next April as opposed to a calendar year. But what you can see on the top is the productivity regime in New Hope Creek versus the wastewater dominated system and the stormwater dominated system. And I think the biggest thing to point out here is the wastewater system is really got high productivity and also that it's super jumpy, right? Um, so it's really high, but also quite um, um, dynamic. I'll also just point out in the, in the middle graph, the blue line is the water temperature. And you can see the temperature of the wastewater system is much higher, particularly in the winter. So I already showed you that New York Creek is a lot hotter now than it used to be. This wastewater stream is staying like it's steaming in the middle of winter because it's getting warm wastewater being injected to it. Um, so it's quite, quite a different regime. And then the hydrograph on the bottom, you can see that both our wastewater and our stormwater system are way flashier. They have that urban stormwater signal that's constantly interrupting and moving the bed. So um, metabolism is a lot higher in the wastewater system than in the forested system. But that does not translate into the production of insect biomass. So this now is monthly estimates of insect production in each of those streams. And we won't get into who's there. It's also interesting, it's way more diverse in the forested site than in the urban sites. But I think it should be very obvious to you, there are a lot more bugs being built in the forested stream than in the wastewater and stormwater site. Despite the fact that uh, productivity is very similar in the forested site and the stormwater site and is much higher in the wastewater site. So we're not efficiently converting the biomass at the base of the food web into secondary production. A lot of the literature suggests you can just estimate secondary production from primary production. It's like 15% of all algal production turns into bugs. And clearly, that really depends on how that production enters the system. So if we put these together, I, I guess Johnny also is about to publish a paper with no y-axis, but this is just a, these are uh, actually set to the right size. Um, the four, so the brown is the ecosystem respiration, the green is the productivity um, that I showed you before. And then the secondary production, much higher uh, trophic transfer efficiency in our forested site, despite lower light use efficiency. Does that make sense? So if you're frequently disturbed, right? Um, you just aren't going to convert as much of that into long-lived diverse biomass. And so I'm just showing you the total amount of secondary production. The other thing is that in the forested site, that's like 25 species. And in the urban sites, it's like four species. So it's also a dramatic change in who is coming out as an insect biomass or fish food. Um, so for me, this is the question that I really want to pursue in the next decade is how do we think about, you know, these Basal changes in the system that received a lot of attention, changes in the flow regime, changes in the light regime, changes in the thermal regime, all themselves influence the energetic regime, right? And the energetic regime actually has quite an echo, like a, a legacy effect of these things that then feed into uh, food web dynamics. And so it's really hard, and I'm really interested in how climate change might affect that. It's really hard to do because it's very hard to find a stream where nothing but climate changes happen. So we're doing this initially with modeling. So I'm gonna talk about a uh, in silico experiment to try and think about uh, these effects. This is work I've been doing with Enrico Bertuzzo, who's a um, hydrologic and ecological modeler from the University of Venice. So basically what we've done is we parameterized the model using data from the Stream Pulse project and the literature to think about how um, algal production is a function of light, um, and hydrologic export, as I've said before. We model litter inputs based on um, seasonality and modus data. Um, and then we actually feed that, uh, feed that into a, a model that's actually full of three different functional groups, grazers that eat algae, collectors that collect fine particular organic material, and shredders that chew up leaf litter. We take a hypothetical river network. You can co configure this any way that you want, but the idea is that you just it allows you to look at how things differ between the headwaters and the main stem in a complex network. Take a network where the light regime is basically smaller streams get less light than big rivers, purely based on like the canopy cover, right? So width. 
And then litter fall goes the opposite way. You get more litter fall coming in in the small stream than in the wide stream. And then with the same inputs of energy from the outside, light and leaf litter, we then subject it to, to two different uh, climate variables and their cross. So the first is we take a baseline hydrograph and then a flashier hydrograph. The flashier hydrograph, we just amplify the extremes on both sides. More water's coming out in peak flows and you have uh, lower flows in between. And then we also did a higher temperature one where we increased the temperature at all points by three degrees C, kind of an IPCC 100 year um, estimate of change. And then we did the cross of that. So we have hotter, we have flashier, we have hotter and flashier. Um, and then we look at what you would predict would happen. And this has all embedded inside of it all kinds of really well worked out uh, models for the bed scour resulting from different flows. So let me walk you through it. So on this graph, I'm looking at course particular gradient. I think of this as leaf litter that falls in the stream. And uh, what we see is that uh, leaf litter tends to accumulate in sort of third and fourth order systems. Um, and as you, um, as you increase the flashiness, you transport more of that litter further downstream. So you sort of push it downstream. That's not really surprising. Like if it's flashier, you're actually mobilizing more of that organic matter. It ends up moving farther downstream. I'll come back to why there's a temperature effect as well in just a second. Fine particular organic matter is made by chewing up algae and um, coarse particular organic matter. So it also shifts downstream. You don't have much of a temperature effect here, but we do have a displacement as a result of flashiness. And I should say on this here, we're looking at on the, the left-hand side is the headwaters moving down the main stem. So you can think about things moving downstream as, the, as, the, as we shift over. And then if we look at algal production, what we see is that flashiness also makes it harder for algae to make a living in the headwaters. So in this graph, it's, I think it's pretty clear that the flashiness signature is much stronger than the thermal signature, even though this is a pretty big thermal increase, the temperature increase. But the temperature increase has a, has a, big, uh, a big role to play in our consumer dynamics. So now we're looking at shredders. So shredders are stoneflies, caddisflies that eat leaf litter. And you can see that they are displaced as a result of the flashiness. So the bolder lines, the flashier system, they've moved downstream. But you can also see that at every point, there are fewer shredders in the hotter situation, right? And this is because almost every piece of the parameters from the literature suggests that trophic efficiency is lower. So if you are trying to eat leaf litter in a hotter environment, you're gonna spend more on respiration and less on biomass production, so you become less efficient. So we actually see that then playing out into fine particular organic matter because we have less shredders producing fines uh, under hotter temperatures. They're less effective, there are fewer of them. And so collectors also um, are affected by temperature. And then the algal production, the grazers really just follow the algae. And again, they have a slight reduction in biomass as a result of thermal extremes. If we add this up, what we see, and this is the main, sort of the main hypothetical result, of course it's a model, but it suggests that as we go from the baseline condition to a warmer and flashier system, here the colors are the total amount of primary consumer production in this river network. In the baseline condition, we have productivity through the whole network. It's always highest in the, in the main stem. If we just go straight to the warmer and flasher, you can see the headwaters are practically nothing is happening. And we have much lower production of all of the consumers in the, in the um, main stem as well. We've basically really constrained the energetic availability to the food web. And what we see in this hypothetical scenario is in the top graph, primary consumer productivity reduced by more than 50% in the hotter and flashier condition. And you can see that these two effects in our model are additive, right? They both lead to individual reduction, then together they lead to more reduction, right? Um, and this, and this, this trophic efficiency is a big part of that story. So this of course is a model, and I can't prove to you that this is what is happening. What I can say is it's consistent with everything that we know about how rivers work and how uh, food web dynamics work in rivers. And I think it may be a very important part of the story of declining freshwater insect um, diversity and biomass across uh, the world. This is a big synthesis that just came out um, last year. Um, Herculean task to synthesize all EPA and USGS records for the last 20 years, um, by, led by Samantha Rumschlag. And it's pretty interesting. I wanted to title this paper to be uh, Warmer and Wormier, um, because what we found is that diversity actually doesn't decline, but it's like what is still there is uh, what is still there in a lot of our urban and ag streams are like a very high diversity of midges, right? And oligarchies. Um, and, but we're losing a lot of sort of the, the sort of charismatic, um, sensitive taxa. 
uh, but massive declines in density. So if you look at total density in every kind of land use category across the United States, we've had substantial declines in density, which is consistent with um, sort of this energetic hypothesis. And I'm not saying it, it's not a result of the hydrologic alteration, the thermal alteration. I'm saying that those things themselves, in addition to the disturbance, the, you know, the effect of the disturbance itself, have a really strong energetic consequence that is likely to be an important part of this story. So over the past 27 years, streams across the United States have seen a decrease in the total density of macroinvertebrates, and urban and agricultural streams have lost the few disturbances of the taxa they once had and gained disturbance tolerant taxa. So this paper originally was set to look at the eff efficacy of the Clean Water Act, which has actually dramatically cleaned up water quality for much of the United States, but we have not seen an increase in the vertebrate density as a result of that. And I think it's because you have these countervailing effects of hydrologic alteration and warming and hypoxia uh, that are gonna act, you know, to make it really harder to see the, the results of just pollution cleanup. Okay, so I wanna make sure we have a little bit of time for questions. I will start with just saying, um, I think it's exciting that it's now possible to measure annual metabolism consistently across many rivers. And we went from having three to having hundreds. Um, and I think now there's something like 500 in our stream pulse data set. I think there are characteristic metabolic regimes in rivers, and we can begin to think about what a river should look like relative to what we measure. Uh, the climate change, land use change, and pollution are all altering these metabolic regimes in ways that we should, we should really work hard to understand. The consequences of freshwater biodiversity are unknown, but uh, likely quite important. And I think it's really easy to think theoretically about why changing the magnitude and timing of productivity is gonna have big implications for the organisms that live in a system. And I really wanna think about how we incorporate this emerging understanding into our management and monitoring of freshwater resources. And I've had a lot of conversations with um, federal and state agencies about how we might begin to move from monitoring chemical pollution to monitor monitoring energetic regimes. And it's actually, because so many people are doing auction already, it's actually a pretty easy step. I'm really proud of this project because we worked really hard to be a completely transparent, open process where all of our code, all of our data, every single bit of it is on the web and available to everyone. And because we did that, we started with nine PIs, but we've had hundreds of people contribute data to the Stream Pulse data set um, with the goal of really raising capacity. And I hope that if any of you are interested, you'll take advantage of this data set and the tools that we put in. And I'm happy to now talk about streams. Thanks. Questions, Pete. Yeah. So, very good talk. Um, complicated enough to like think about stream networks, but when we try to like yeah. come up with like a characteristic system regionally, we where do you start to layer in like the connected lake reservoir? Did you guys get into that at all? Or? We didn't get into the lakes and reservoirs, but I do think, I think that we are reducing the amount of time carbon spins in rivers in general which probably is putting more of it into lakes and reservoirs, right? And so we're probably displacing a lot um, downstream, which, so if you think about it just moving, right, a lot of times it's getting stuck in reservoirs. And so I think in North Carolina, where we don't have any natural lakes, right, we just have tons of reservoirs, a lot of what used to get processed in New Hope Creek is now getting processed in the Jordan Lake Reservoir that it goes into. But it's a good point, right? But then again, it's, it's not contributing to stream biodiversity. It's probably getting stuck in the bottom of a reservoir. Yes. Yes, Barbara. It really depends, right, on how, whether it gets in there with a bunch of sediment, how, if that bottom layer is going hypoxic, you know, so a lot of it, yes, right? But then it's responsible for filling in the reservoir and it may contribute to methane production, so it's complicated, right? Um, I do think, you know, from a carbon standpoint, I guess, I'm concerned that we're always thinking about like, how do we store more carbon? And like, okay, fine, maybe we store more carbon at the bottom of a reservoir, yay. But if we've done it at the expense of like not being able to support the food of a, of a river, is that what we want, right? So I think making sure we don't forget about the biodiversity component as we're thinking about the carbon sequestration is something I'm, I'm really committed to thinking about. Great question. I, 
I, I just don't like we're not going to rivers are never going to be a great part of the terrestrial carbon sink. So that I think we're going to get a better and better refinement around that number. Um, they're much better at like moving terrestrial carbon uh, into the atmosphere, into the ocean than they are at producing it. But again, that like that small number is still vitally important to supporting freshwater biodiversity. Right. Um, I don't think even if we even if we removed all of the things that are interrupting current productivity, I don't think we would massively increase the freshwater carbon sink in rivers. Right, but I think we would have a huge impact on the secondary production in rivers. Does that make sense? Or maybe I'm not. Maybe not following you. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, you're right. So lots of terrestrial carbon estimates of what they think of as a carbon sink. Some portion of that is almost always a lateral loss to. Um, uh, DIC or DOC that's moving into rivers and may not actually be sequestered at all, right? And so that's a big that's a big uncertainty in a lot of terrestrial ecosystem models that is not always acknowledged. Yeah, and Pete, Pete thinks about that all the time. <laughs> Thanks. Really interesting. As someone who doesn't work on rivers and streams at all, I'm curious. You talked about having two, I think, like 207 rivers, but I'm curious, like if you took a measure like a hundred meters downstream, would it look more like the same stream or would it look like a different stream? If there's riffles versus you take it in riffles versus pools or behind a rock. And so I'm just trying to understand there's what so much variation. Mean? There's yeah. like, are you even starting? Can you even characterize like within a river, much less like across these rivers? Like what is signal? What is noise here? Um, I'm sure you thought about that. I'm just kind of yeah. curious, how do you understand that? data point in one stream. It's, it has a lot of parallels with using eddy flux towers to measure terrestrial productivity, right? Like you're, you're always there too measuring a footprint, right? Based on air, ex air mass exchange, right? And so, and actually with an eddy flux tower, like where your footprint is may be changing over time based on the direction of wind, right? And the speed of wind. Same thing's happening in a river, except it's like you're getting different amounts of distance upstream. And I, I think we've got a lot of work to do there to get better at it. We, we are doing a bunch of work in Hook Creek right now, actually taking like compartmentalized systems and seeing like how different are the different pieces. You're typically getting, you know, anywhere in, we can calculate the length of the footprint and it changes over time, right? But you're not like, you don't get a different number if you're like on one side of a pool and the other side of a pool, right? But you can get a very different number if you're in a system that's like the residence time of water has dramatically changed. Um, really deep, slow rivers versus really fast ripples are obviously going to be quite different from each other. Um, and that is a piece of the work that we need to get better at as well. Oh, right. So, um, so you, you could, you could play around with, uh, changing the residence time of water by manipulating like low flow. You could see reservoirs in there. You could do all kinds of things that might change the, uh, and I think they have a big impact on carbon, how much carbon gets out of the system. I'm not sure how much impact they'd have on secondary reduction, but it'd be a fun thing to play around with. It's a good question. We have a lot of work to do, right? I feel like we're on the cusp, right? And it's interesting to me that this ecosystem metabolism work began in aquatic systems. And then the terrestrial folks went crazy and did a great job developing Eddie Flux and Ameriflux, right? You've got this whole community of people doing really hardcore modeling of what's happening, and we have not had that happen in rivers yet, and we, we need it. So I, I, I think there's, there's so much improvement that can be made, but we're really far from where we were eight years ago. So I'm, I'm gonna just take the, you know, the advance. Yeah, over here. Yeah, it's really interesting how um, the primary Okay, so the metabolism, like three annual patterns before we did this, there are three published papers. There will be three published papers when Johnny publishes his paper that have done this linking of primary production, secondary production rivers. So we're like, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got, we don't have much data on that. And I think it's, it's been really interesting that the places where people have been doing community college and people where people have been doing stream ecosystem ecology are not the same places. Right, and a lot of the places where a lot of the secondary production is being done are really steep headwater streams where our methods don't work. So it's really, it's hard. It's actually quite hard to link these two things. And I, I again, think it's incredibly important we start bringing these perspectives together because it, it's an important question.
So I don't know. Charlie Hall's paper is the only one that did that. He actually went all the way to fish. The whole community. It's a great paper. Okay. With that, we have stop. to okay. end it because a class is coming in in like two minutes. Thank you all.